And one of the things that I think, uh, if you talk about like an in, the enemies of unity, and I think that's just one thing I would love for us to just touch on really quick, like a couple of things that are enemies of, of unity. <clears throat> like Nick Miller, the enemy is the inner me. The uh-huh. enemy. That's so funny. Sorry, go no. ahead. Um, that, New girl. <laughs> are you done? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, Welcome to the Purpose Podcast. My name is Rachel. I'm here with my husband, Zach, and we believe that God has set you apart to win your world. Mm -hmm. And that's your purpose. And your purpose really is our passion. So you can find what you're listening to right now on all podcast platforms and YouTube and all the things. So if you enjoy what you're hearing right now or you hear something. And they do. Of course, they love it. If, you, it. if it challenges you or encourages you, we challenge you to send it to a friend. Just hit the share button. And if you um, want to be made aware of when our next podcast drops, you can always hit the like and subscribe so that you have all information Don't readily miss out, available. People. Don't miss out. Okay, that was everything for a while. Okay, I thought we were gonna really like team up on them there about not missing out, but you just left me out to dry. Nope, don't miss out. No, it's too late now. Now it's like a doofus. <laughs> okay, that was that's good. All right, so we are going to get into something that is huge over the next huge. couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what you'll jump in on. You'll jump in on Trump impressions, but you won't jump in. He's on so them. fun to impersonate. He is. I wish huge. I could comb my hair over like that. Yes. Uh, okay, okay, we can't fall down that rabbit hole. Um, especially talking about unity. Okay, we're talking Dark. about unity. That okay. is hilarious. We're, we're, we are going to talk uh, in the next couple of weeks about unity. Really excited. We have uh, a guest coming on that is is unbelievable. It's going to be super impactful. It is funny. Uh, we didn't plan on bringing that up, but t- thinking about unity, and we're not going to talk about this podcast, but some of the things that uh, make people you know, divide people the most. And just, it's funny that came up, just a Trump impression. feels like politics divides people. Yeah. Like you just, if you say that you like somebody, then you like, you don't like the person who likes that person because they like that person. Oh yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. It's crazy. Like how easily we are divided now. Like it's so much easier it's so much easier to be divided than united, uh, which, uh, again, I think that, that that's probably pretty natural because the, the God wants us to be united and, uh, and again, just a, a, a ploy of the enemy. But you mind setting up what we're going to go over today, what we're going to talk about today? Yeah, we are. We're, we're going to talk about unity. And a lot of times, um, you know, unity is just, it's different people feel different ways about it. And there's so much nuance. And so what we want to do is just take a little bit of time to just broadly talk about what unity is and why it's important, why you need it. And uh, so we're going to talk about unity specifically in the church. I love John Piper makes a, a point about unity. And he says, if you have unity and there's no goodness applied to it, there's no need for the unity. So um, one of the things that's beautiful about unity within the church is it is specifically has goodness, um, the, which is God's like God's will, God's um, mission and vision attached to that unity. And so when we think about, hey, what does unity in the church really look like? It's a church, it's people who are enjoying their common salvation, which is the fact that we are all sinners who have been saved by grace through faith to be in relationship with God. And that to be then be unified in that is that they are earnestly, those people who have been saved are earnestly contending for the faith. And that faith is literally they're earnestly contending for salvation always the gospel always so we're going to just look at you know kind of how god feels about you unity is a big deal we say well god wants us to have unity well why would you say that well so glad you asked yeah and even before we get into that and we want to be really careful we're not today we're talking about uh just uh, god wants us to be in unity and so biblical be- unity yeah before we talk about before we talk about like all the things that divide us and stuff like that we'll talk about that next time like it's it's amazing, you know. There are two verses that I love: Psalms one thirty three one. How wonderful and pleasant is it when brothers live in harmony, when we live in unity? Or Malachi two ten. We, are, are we all not of the same Father? Mm. Are we not all created uh, by the same God? And that, uh, you know, 
whenever we get so like socialized and we get so um, yeah, again like Rome, Romans twelve two it, when it says uh, let's be transformed by the new of our mind not conform to the power of this world well the power of the world is division it is disunity it is like whether whether it's to it's to have your buddies and or if it's to step on other people to make yourself better like whatever it is like we are. I, our flesh, my flesh, is mm-hmm. just naturally geared towards mm-hmm. division. Well, you have to remember that the world, who is the prince of this world, you know, yeah. devil, he is the accuser. And so an accuser is always coming in to bring division. And so if you've been, and we all are influenced by the world, we have to be aware of, hey, you know, there's, there is there are tendencies in me to want to accuse somebody. And that is, that's not how God sets himself up as, you know, it's, God's not described as yeah. the accuser. And so I want to make sure, like, as we talk about, like, it's so beautiful what God did when Jesus, when you are rescued from your sin and your shame and you are brought into the family of God, um, you are a part of the body of of Christ. And that is pretty incredible. You now have family and it doesn't mean you're always going to agree on everything. It doesn't mean you're always going to like what everybody has to do. There are, we are all people, everybody's broken. Um, but what we can do is love God so much that we can love each other so much that we can work through those things, um, and come to the other side, still honoring God and honoring people. And like like you just said, like our, you just kind of, I don't know if you meant to, but you reference our, like our values. We talked about them last time, but love God, love people, discover purpose and win your world. Like you can have theological or biblical disagreements about all those things and still do them. You know, like we can have, we can see God, you know, again, biblically, there's, whether it's on like predestination or whatever. Like I was you, thinking it was like Calvinism and Arminianism. You can have these differences. We won't get into all that today, but like you can have these differences, yeah. but still like agree on a higher level, right? Uh, which is fine. Like a, one, one of my great friends, Steve Kerr, you know, we're talking last night, you know, we, we, we did the student ministry thing. It was awesome. And, and we're talking about like pressing and moving the vision forward. He says, I know that there's probably th- like nuanced theological difference between us, but because we're so like united in what we care about most, which is loving God the most and, and pursuing people, like ah, like th- those little things, they just those things that might divide us, they're so small in comparison to these things that unite us. You know, it's just I I, I don't know, but we just get so stuck on being divided. It, it's so tasty. So it sorry. is tasty. So let's talk about. I want a little bit about like the secret to unity. It really starts with how we view ourselves um, within the body of Christ. And so when we think about like, remember, like when you got saved, you were brought into the body of Christ, the body of Christ, why we need unity? Well, a body is not super effective if it is in a bunch of different parts. Right. So you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to get anything done without unity. And God tells us why we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a little bit. But the key verse that addresses that is Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. And I love this um, quote. I want to say this is from this is from got questions um, dot org. But this quote is disunity in a church is most often caused when we act selfishly and consider ourselves better than others. And so I like as you think about any experience, everybody has experienced disunity. And so when we when we process through when we have caused and again, that takes some awareness and we'll talk a little bit next time about why unity is so hard. But just like, hey, this is the enemy of unity is selfish ambition. And so we want to know, hey, like being a part of the body of Christ is a gift. And my goal is to lay my life down for the gospel and for the people that I love, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we want to make sure that we talk through and, and really remind you of is that unity is an expression of humility, gentleness, and patience. And that's what it says in Ephesians 4, 2, that bearing in love with one another. In order to do that, we have to have humility, gentleness, and patience. Yeah. And um, that's so good. And what is, and that's really like when you think about, hey, 
We talked last time, like, oh, it was so amazing that Jesus, people wanted to be around Jesus. Well, of course they wanted to be around Jesus because he was humble and gentle and patient with the people that he was sitting across the table from. But you know, so why, I was just sitting here thinking about what stops me, what stops us people from being like humble and putting other people for ourselves. And we do it when we talk about marriage counseling. Which, gosh, if there's anywhere you want to be united, it's with your spouse, right? But with the divorce rates and everything else, you see that that's not easy either. But one of the things that we say when we do marital counseling is, hey, you're giving up. Being right doesn't matter anymore. Which if everybody could get that, like if everybody could live a life where being right isn't what's most important, like where I'm not waiting on you to get done talking so I can say what I have to say so that I can have the last word so I can be right. um, there, there, There is something... To that, you know, I, I think that being right, if we could just, if we just give up, because what humility it takes to give up being right. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm connected mm-hmm. to what you said about Jesus. Mm-hmm. Jesus knew it all, right? And you, you know, like we talked last time, we're blown away about how, why, like how people who weren't religious tax collectors and sinners, prostitutes, they wanted to be around Jesus. Um, he obviously he wasn't sinning with them. It said he never sinned. He knew it all. Like he, like he, he was the word became flesh. It says that in John. So he knew it all, but he obviously didn't live in such a way where he had to be right, or lost people would mm-hmm. hate to be around him, right? Oh, yeah. Well, you know what he did not have was um, he wasn't self righteous. He was so confident in who he was, and maybe that's what maybe the insecurity I, we feel is part of what. Well, when you are self righteous, it means that you've built up your. You're good enough. Your righteousness, which, mm. by the way, is as filthy rags compared to um, yeah. what you can offer the your, Lord. Yours, okay. yours is. Mine's pretty good. Boo. And um, <laughs> so you, like, when we make ourselves righteous in our own eyes, when we have built up in our own mind, I'm good enough, I'm smarter, I'm better. And when we operate out of self-righteousness and not the righteousness of Christ, it removes the space for humility It makes a way for pride. And when that, when you are self-righteous, which we see, that's what he talks about the Pharisees. They're walking in their self-righteousness because they had obeyed all the laws and they still were far from heaven. Man, it it allows for us to, what it does is it makes way for division. Mm-hmm. And so when we put on the righteousness of Christ, what it does, that's what's so beautiful about unity is it exemplifies Jesus because yeah. the aim of unity in the church is not so that, you know, you could all sing Kumbaya. There's going to be disagreement and, and not everybody. Can, we're all very different people and had different experiences and are called to do different things. Yeah. Not everybody's called to do the same exact thing, right. but that what it does, the aim of unity first and foremost is to prosper the gospel. Yeah, totally. And so you cannot, the gospel is not haughty. The gospel is not proud. Mm -hmm. The gospel is literally blanketed grace and mercy and humility that Jesus would come and humble himself, first of all, to become humanity, but second, to be put upon a cross and never once justify himself, sinless, accused of breaking the law and never once does he say i did not i didn't i didn't disgrace god i didn't dishonor god right. i i didn't do any of the things that you're saying even I on the did. cross you didn't do that on the cross and he had every right to and that's the thing i think we forget like unity is not about when we talk about hey biblical unity it's not about our rights we gave up our rights to jesus of course there are situations and space where hey we want to in love have conversations but you know at the end of the day if our self-righteousness is in the room unity can't be yeah. and so jesus um when he asks us to be unified and he says they're going to know who i am because of the way you love each other because of unity yeah it's because the gospel Right. Is humble. Yeah. And I think that's why in Ephesians 6, it talks about the armor of God, you know, the breastplate of righteousness. Like you're what you're known for, what people see first on you and in you is his righteousness. But again, we don't want to talk about the things that take away from unity. Uh, it, it That does help us know what something is by looking at what it's not. But the reasons for unity are so much bigger. They're so much better than these things that that cause us not to be united. And there there were two scriptures I wanted to share, but it goes on what you said. Like the the best reason for us to be united is the gospel. I mm-hmm. think it's in John 13, 35 or something like that. He says that Jesus says That's they will, exactly it. Is it <laughs> yes. oh, high five. He says they will know who you are. Or sorry, they, yeah, they will know who you are by your love for one another. But I love this, because you would say 
Like actually, forty seven percent of at least millennials feel like it's it's morally wrong to share your faith because if you share your faith, like if you share the Christian faith, then you have to say there's only two places somebody could go: heaven or hell. And so, like millennials feel forty seven percent anyway, and the, the numbers increasing feel like it's wrong, morally wrong to share their faith. So we're obviously not united on that. But even in, but just when you think about the love from it, in which is, this is one of the big verses around sharing your faith. In 1 Peter 3, 15, and you'll know it when you hear it, but it says this, but in your hearts, revere Christ as, uh, as Lord. Uh, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. So always be ready to share your faith in every, in every season. But do this, this is the big part that everybody leaves out. This is still in verse 15. But do this with gentleness and respect. And it keeps on going to verse 16. Keeping a clear conscience, because the clear conscience is not based on what you think what you said was right or wrong. It's based in the in the light, in the mirror of what God said unity is. Yeah. Right? And so that unity is loving people. So in clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. And so the reason that Christianity is so special is even people who don't believe in Christ when they're around Christians should be impacted because we desire to be united with them too. Like th- this last weekend, uh, or not this one, Easter weekend, there was a there was a uh, an Islamic lady, a, a Muslim lady that came in. She had is it hijab? Is that what it's called? She had her hijab on, and everything. We were talking, and this was wild. She came up to me after we're in the lobby, we're talking, and she said, "I know the difference between this is like probably one of the best compliments I've ever heard about our church." She said, "I realized today the difference between you guys and us talking about Muslims and Christians." And I'm like, "Oh my gosh, what's that?" And she said, "You guys are all about love." And we're all about fear. And I was just like overwhelmed right by that. Because what she heard is actually a rebuke to Christians that, hey, we're not loving people well, so let's stand up and repent. And she watched Christians do that, and it impacted her. But it was like she realized, hey, that she's not a Christian. But because of the desire to love people was there by believers, she was impacted by the gospel. And so it said even people who plan to speak maliciously of you because of your desire for love and respect, people should be impacted by the gospel. And so I think we got to know that. First of all, it's very clear we have to have an answer. And and I, as far as the Holy Spirit and Jesus and God are concerned, you can have an answer mm-hmm. with respect mm-hmm. and gentleness mm-hmm. and love mm-hmm. and still be united with people who they don't believe in Jesus yet. So unity is not simply common... Um, it's not, you know, being related through a common organization. So unity, it goes beyond just saying, hey, I'm a part of the church. Or going back to what we said, it's not, it's not about total consensus. And it's not about total consensus. It is. <coughs> a, this is what's interesting in John 17, 21. Jesus says, uh, I ask I was going. they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Mm-hmm. And that is the, the chief aim of unity, why it's important is it's a witness to the world, but it also is an acclamation of the glory of God. That's what I love. That's how um, John Piper articulates that. And I just thought it was so good that it is about not just the witness to the world, but the it's an acclamation to the glory of God yeah. because it is because we are wired in a broken, sinful, our flesh is wired for disunity. It's wired to be the best. It's wired to be right. It's wired to be above, to rank people, to, to shove somebody down is to expose. But Jesus says, Hey, uh, the glory of God is so great. And he's so wonderful. He said that if like, if we could operate in such a way where that is not present but that just the glory of god is acknowledged right. like how amazing is that to show not just the witness but it's like it's a gift to god it, it, it notes how powerful we believe he is that we would submit and surrender and honor and and see a picture of how incredibly beautiful and wonderful he is by the way that we would operate within the body of Christ. Yeah, and actually, since you brought it there, because again, something you said a minute ago that I think is pro- is the most powerful thing uh, of of the podcast that the re- the primary reason 
for unity is the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. And when we think about any theological or personal disagreements, they all acquiesce, they all submit to the gospel. Every time Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, in Matthew 6, in Luke 11, he told them to pray, my kingdom come. Well, his kingdom comes through unity. Going back to what you said in John 17, the reason what you the reason why what you said is so powerful is Jesus, this is Jesus is about to die here. And this is his prayer for all believers, right? So this is like we talked a little bit a few podcasts ago about like Holy Week and all that kind of stuff. This is smack in the middle of that. And actually, before what you read, it, uh, in verse 20, it says, My prayer is not for them alone. So Jesus wants very clear that we can't escape this. This is not just for the 12 or the 11 disciples or the 120 in the upper room. But he says, I, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, which is us, which is every believer. This is, this is, the, this is the Mecca for the church is these people, right? And then what you said, there will be, be one, and that, and that uh, they may also be in us. And, um, that the world may believe in you that you sent me, but then it keeps on going. I have given them the glory that you have given that you gave me, which Jesus never used that glory to elevate Himself. Come on, He always used it to sacrifice Himself. That they because if you have that glory in you, you don't need other people to glorify you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so e either way, so but it keeps on going. It says that they may be as one as you and I are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. And then and then, then the world will know that you sent me, and I have loved them even as you have loved me. So the very reason that he's praying, I, I, you think about, like, like, again, my dad is my hero. You know, we, we both love our moms and dads. And I, I really do think the, probably the last thing I'll ask my dad to do for me is pray for me. And what he prays for me is going to be, so impactful to me. I'm going to ask him, I don't know how old I'll be, you know, but I'm going to ask him to pray that my, my best days are, you know, just the stuff. Yeah. So Jesus is praying for them right here. This is, I, if, if I'm not mistaken, this is the last recorded prayer that we had that he prays over them right here in John 17. Mm. And his desire is they would be united as Jesus and the Father are united so that the world would know that he sent him. And so Again, we're going to talk more about what causes people to be not united, but I I think the a, a reason a reason that you you have uh, I won't give a bunch of detail. People don't know who it is, but you have one of your friends who she says she's your liberal friend. Yes, there's people. I love my liberal friend that we are so we disagree with. You know, we all, all these kind of things, but whenever it's in. When it's in comparison, those well, she makes the joke. She said, "I can't believe it's it's very funny because where we live, there are quite a few people with conservative views." And she was talking about how she couldn't believe, like how God would send her somewhere, and she would love so dearly people that she has such drastic views from. Yeah, but whenever you compare, when you compare heaven and hell to liberal or conservative. It just, it just doesn't matter. Well, it's so pales in comparison. And one of the things that I think, uh, if you talk about like an en the enemies of unity, and I think that's just one thing I would love for us to just touch on really quick, like a couple of things that are enemies of, of unity. <clears throat> like Nick Miller, the enemy is the inner me. The uh -huh. enemy. That's so funny. Sorry, go no. ahead. Um, that New girl. <laughs> are you done? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> It is uh, one of those things is the is the inability to consider nuance like we so one of the things that allows for somebody to uh, for us to have those differing opinions to have disagreement um, but still be uh, to love each other is like we can consider nuance like we could possibly disagree on this thought and agree on this other thought that there is so much more in in play than just um, siloing out, uh, which we we find that when you do that, if you silo anything out from its context, what you'll do is you will misinterpret it. So if you take a verse out of scripture 
and you just read that out of context without the, the greater context of the whole counsel of the word of God or out of historical context, you'll eisegesis and you will, you'll misinterpret that scripture. If you pull something that somebody believes in, hey, they have a thought, an idea, or an opinion, and you pull it out of that person and just throw it up on the wall, you will misinterpret or misunderstand that person. So what we have to, one of the enemies of unity is our inability to slow down and consider the whole person and that there's nuance to every conversation and every thought. And that requires us to believe like, hey, that God made that person, that that person has experiences that I don't have, that they have, um, that God's spoken things, that they've, that they've walked through stories that I, I didn't walk and humility to listen. It doesn't mean you're going to agree, but being, uh, but being able to listen to the entirety of, of what they have, not just hearing their thought or their opinion and then moving on. Yeah. And asking questions. Mm-hmm. You know, I love you. You just think about Jesus and the woman caught redheaded in the act of adultery. You know, she's laying before him. You know, maybe maybe has a sheet on her, maybe, and you know, and he 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 has the wherewithal to ask her, "Who's here to accuse you?" You know, I mean, and so just the. But if we don't ask any questions, like you're right, there's no nuance. If somebody somebody's angry, you know, how many people have we talked to that hate the Lord, like they hate God? And then, and then you you want you want to you want to be frustrated with them, and then you find out they were molested, or you find out that you know they were they were like these terrible things that yeah their their parents were lost at a young age yeah and, or like, yeah mm-hmm. a Christian uh, a Christian hurt them yeah or or and, and like Neil deGrasse Tyson who Neil deGrasse Tyson you know who is one of the s- smartest people on the planet you know he says he says all the time when people ask him about God this is his stock answer he says. You know, people talk about God. They say he's either all loving or he's all loving and he's all powerful. But he says, I see a world with childhood polio and like Mm -hmm. tsunamis and all these kind of things. And he says his thought on God is if there is a God, he has to be one or the other. He has to either be all powerful or he has to be all loving, but he can't be both. You know, and I, I see somebody who's been hurt. I see somebody who has seen hurt and nobody has potentially, or he's maybe he's, maybe he's, um, he's, not received it, but nobody's walked through, hey, God gave us free will. And that free will has broken the world that he planned for us. And until we surrender and he comes back after everybody's heard the gospel, until he comes back, we won't live in perfection. But again, like you just, you hear a statement and that that from a statement, you decide if I'm for or against this person from that one statement. You know, like again, you hear about the Mm -hmm. nuance, which is just, which is just crazy. Well, and then I would say another enemy is our lack of, uh, you want to call it pride, you want to call it insecurity, whatever it is, but it's the inability to hear anything else. Mm -hmm. And that is, for me, one of the things that concerns me most within, and I would say the global church that we see when we talk about division, like that enemy of unity, people who who are loving and contending for the faith are willing to humble themselves and hear, hey, I'm I'm listening to you. I hear your story. I hear your experience. And I'm willing to love you right where you are. Yeah. And that is, but we're so insecure and we're so self-righteous and we're so prideful that we can't even humble ourselves enough to ask the question, hey, why do you feel that way? Why do you think that way? Would you would you share your story with me? Yeah, and I think that part of that, if you give people the benefit of the doubt, I think part of that is there's a fear in us that God doesn't have an answer for it, mm. that God doesn't have an answer, which is it's not true. Now, I, there's been plenty of times where I've been witnessing to people or whatever, and they've had a question I didn't know the answer to, and I had to go find it, and I've always been able to find it, whether it's online or through counsel with people or whatever, but I think there's part of us, this little concern that God doesn't have an answer for some of these things, so we close ourselves off to people asking the question. And I, we do the Lord a disservice with that. Hey, but what, one more thing, and again, we really want to focus on uh, on how, like, why we should be united. So let me quiz you, babe, see if you've been listening to my leadership lessons I give you. What is... I have not been listening. <laughs> what is... <laughs> there's one thing that unites teams more than anything else. Do you remember what it is? 
there's one thing that unites teams more than anything. The vision. No. Great, great guess. You may have never told you. Crisis. Crisis. Just so, kidding. It's crisis. Crisis unites teams more than anything. So like you, I failed the test. No, oh, it, but even visions. No. So like I, I would say that at Faith Promise, like the staff and the winning team, they agree with the vision. Every, everybody wants to win the world. You know, it's too biblical. We have to equip Christ followers to win their world. It's the only way to do it. So like everybody's fine with that. But we still have divisions. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to crisis, so wow. think of think about some of these crises like that you've experienced in your life. Maybe you know, maybe you you experienced nine eleven. Or maybe you experience like some of these school shootings or something like that. Now, afterwards, when people are nitpicking each other and fighting and all that kind of stuff in the wake of people's devastating pain, which is a different conversation, when the crisis is happening, like it, it, we don't have time for that. Like whenever it was 9 11, I, I guarantee you, if there were firemen or police officers that struggled with racism, it had nothing, it, it didn't even cross their mind. There's people who are buried in this rubble. We got to go. It doesn't matter. Like you don't even see, you don't you don't see anything besides we got to go. We got we got to get this done. Or like uh, again, they, they talk about it in like the seals and these military things. Like like when it, whenever it's crisis time, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, man, woman, black, white, republic, democrat. It's crisis, and we have to survive. If there's never been a crisis like the crisis of eternity, there's never been a crisis like where will somebody spend the rest of their life. And so whenever we think about. Um, what in the world could bring unity, even to Christians? There is a crisis. There is a mm-hmm. crisis that if we believe the Bible, you look at Matthew 25. We believe the Bible, Matthew 23 and Matthew 25, when it talks about the parables of the end times. There will be a time when there's a separation from the sheep and the ghosts. There will be a separation of people who know Jesus and don't. And that's a crisis. Mm-hmm. That's a crisis because there's people that you and I love that currently would not go to heaven. That's a crisis. And whenever we get sidelined or sidetracked by these other things that they divide us, you know, it's because we're living in a reality where we have forgotten the crisis that exists. Mm. And so again, when you think about love, we think about, or not love, sorry, when you think about unity, there is a crisis that exists that is worth uniting for and overcoming whatever, if you're a believer anyway, any division that may exist, and it's worth it. Like you said, the power and the truth of the gospel is worth uniting no matter what. So let me just give us a couple of things to consider as we say, hey, how do I engage in unity? I want to be unified. So the first thing that we've got to do is we have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit drives unity. You're not going to experience it without it. So if you're a stranger to the Holy Spirit, you're probably going to be a stranger to unity. The second thing that we would encourage you to do is is strive to know and spread the truth about Christ. When you are around and talking about the truth of Jesus Christ as your Savior and how you've been filled with the Holy Spirit and you're seeing what God, man, you're going to find yourself with some other people who are doing the same thing. So you're going to attract who you are. So be somebody who talks about the truth of Jesus and you will see other people who will come alongside you who are doing the same thing. The other thing that we want to encourage you to do is love Christians across boundaries. We're going to have disagreements. There's going to be things that we um, we don't love, but we don't have to hate people. We, mm-hmm. we, we can love people and dislike what they do or disagree with how they choose to do things. But what we want to do is make sure that we are loving people even when we disagree with them and the emotional climate that we live in makes that ridiculously hard. Mm-hmm. And um, so some, just a reminder, unity is not based on your feelings. Mm-hmm. Unity is based on the gospel. And then finally, um, we want to encourage you to serve Christians across boundaries for the sake of your witness. Don't just serve people that you don't like, but serve people who you disagree with love them and um, do your very best to be in unity with them. When it's all said and done, 
there are going to be lots of ambiguities that remain. Mm -hmm. You know, that the Bible is not clear on exactly how how a church should be defined versus a school, and like especially in like our American context. Like what the world does not look anything like back what we were talking about. So how should specific, like with policies about churches and schools and um, what about conferences and denominations, like all of this, this is not like laid out in black and white. Um, but we do know who, who the church is and we do know who God's called us to be. And we do know that the gospel is for going mm. and that we get to humbly serve at the pleasure of King Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, um, when we find other people that want to do that too, we can, we can find ourselves in unity, even, um, in disagreement. Yeah. Well, Hey, we love you guys so much and we really do. We believe and are so passionate about your purpose uh, to win the world. And so remember, there is a crisis that is worth uniting Mm -hmm. over, uh, which is eternity, which is the gospel. So we love you. Win your world this week. We'll see you next week.